are several reasons why Wild Cornell is a really outstanding place to perform this research. First of all, there's an unprecedented level of collaboration between clinical investigators, clinicians, laboratory investigators, pathologists, and also basic scientists, for example, mathematics, computational modeling, and even in nanotechnology. That's the reason why I came here, because I realized that the fastest acceleration of bench to bedside would come from working in such an environment. And I found that it's a tremendous catalyst for making discoveries and then being able to move them into the clinical testing and practice arena. So from the time I came here, we have uh, extensive and frequent uh, weekly meetings between clinicians and laboratory scientists. We have grants together. We have built programs together. They extend uh, even uh, the, the enthusiasm that this has generated has even led to many scientists from other institutions coming to Cornell to interact with us because they realize that this is really the premier place for translational medicine to happen. Um, it occurs in a very unselfish and collaborative manner. Uh, there really isn't uh, the interference of egos or uh, politics. It's really just a matter of people are all focused on trying to, uh, to cure these diseases. The barrier towards being able to effectively treat uh, cancers has been lack of knowledge of the nuts and bolts that make cells tick. Um, and uh, up to now, really, there has we really our knowledge of how cells work has been incredibly superficial, and um, and so the perceived slowness or difficulty in treating cancer has been really just because we don't even know how normal cells work. So in order to be able to more fundamentally and effectively figure out how to treat cancers, it's necessary to first understand. Uh, in great detail how the actual molecular machines, what they look like even, and find out what do they even look like. If you don't even know what they look like, it's very hard to figure out how they work. You have to figure out if they have, you know, if certain machine parts are located in certain uh, configurations. I guess you'd also consider these, these, these the molecules that, um, that rule cancer cells and make them behave in a poor fashion as kind of like lock and key mechanisms in a way, because they're very intricately designed and very specific in how they work. So uh, for us, the uh, goal has been to visualize and characterize at the nuts and bolts level how these mechanisms work, how the machine parts fit together. If you know what gear fits into the next gear that's next to it for the whole machine to work, then you have a sense of how you might actually go in there and put a piece of chewing gum in the middle so the gears lock and the machine can't move forward. You know, the pace of discovery has accelerated so much in cancer that even five years is a, is a longer window than what's, you know, now, now the, the translation is happening much faster than that. So, uh, for example, um, just to cite uh, one thing that we're very excited about, it was recently discovered that there is frequent mutation in the most common form of the Hodgkin lymphoma in one of the machines that writes a certain epigenetic chemical modification. Within a year, within one year, drugs were already designed against this machine. And um, we in fact, recently published a report a few months ago showing that if you inhibited this machine, that lymphoma cells die. The drugs have been developed rapidly by pharmaceutical companies and we are already testing these in preclinical models of lymphoma, and they could be in clinical trials within a year or at the most two years. So you're talking about a two-year between discovery and publication of the mutation and clinical trials at two to three years. And this is now becoming more and more typical. So the, uh, the increasing technological power to design small molecules and to uh, modify them chemically and to turn them around into treatments is, is accelerating greatly. Some of these come from laboratories that, like ours that build their own molecules and part of them come from collaborations with pharmaceutical companies that have vast abilities to screen millions and millions of molecules at a time. From the diagnostic standpoint, um, there was a, a new and very common mutation just discovered, published two months ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, which um, 
we were able to ex uh, rapidly um, explore in the context of a clinical trial. And uh, two months after that, we already found that uh, this particular mutation can tell you whether or not a patient should get one dose, a higher dose or a lower dose of chemotherapy. And so um, <clears throat> this mutation uh, can be measured. We already, we're now setting up to start measuring this routinely. And so here's an example of a mutation that went from being discovered to being clinically applicable in a matter of months. So things are really, you know, things are changing. We're able to turn science into medicine much faster. It's a very exciting time to be doing this kind of research. On the one hand, proteins or, or molecules that uh, control cell behavior have specific shapes. And they all fit together in certain ways. So if you can figure out how to build mo uh, therapeutic molecules that fit into some of the contours and shapes that these cancer-causing factors have, then <clears throat> these different factors can no longer cooperate to make cells behave in a cancerous fashion. So the work that we, the work that we do, on the one hand, is to characterize the, how these mechanisms fit together and then develop molecules that can fit inside and block them from functioning as a machine. There are millions of gears. There are millions of them. And so uh, it's not like there are two. There are millions of gears. And the gears, in fact, might be slightly different in different individual people, So, which is where the personalization part comes in. It also isn't just one mechanism or machine that drives cancer, but there are generally multiple different machines that work together as a group and collectively are required for cancer cells to function. So hitting just one of the machines also is not enough. So another challenge in cancer therapy is to figure out um, how the different machines work together and which components of those machines would be most impactful on the cancer cell to disrupt in order to uh, kill tumor cells. So some of the recent work that we published has been on using uh, a combination of experimental methods and computational modeling and mathematical modeling to predict which machines work together and then to use specific small molecules that disrupt those various machines at the same time to achieve maximal killing of tumor cells. And these are all things that are very specific to these mechanisms. They aren't chemotherapy or poisons that just kill cells. They just go in and disrupt these machines without affecting other cellular components. And so they are fairly innocuous to normal cells because normal cells aren't as dependent on these mechanisms as tumor cells are. And so you can combine them together, achieving very powerful anti-tumor effects, really with almost no effect on normal tissues. Another aspect to what we just talked about is um, trying to decode the instructions that govern tumor cells. So these are the instructions that actually direct cells towards making those molecular machines. They don't come out of nowhere, they have to be built by the cell. And they're built based on instructions. And the instructions are contained both uh, inside of the DNA that cells have, but also in other um, parts of the cells that interact with DNA. And so collectively, these, um, these non-DNA instructions are called epigenetic instructions. We call the epi because they're outside of DNA, but they work in concert with the instructions that are in DNA. If you put together those two layers, these two compartments of what basically is the software that runs the cell, um, then you can learn a great deal about how individual cells from different people function. Now, an important concept in human biology is that obviously we're all different from each other. You can readily tell each person how they look just by looking at them. It doesn't require any special science. Um, and just how we look very different from each other, how our cells function is equally different as how we look. It isn't like we're just, it's just the shape of our, you know, the hair color or the eyes or the height or that differs. Just a, it's, it's even more different inside the cells. And that obviously has a big impact on tumors because the tumors that arrive from each individual will behave according to those differences. They won't be necessarily all the same. They're called breast cancer, maybe, because they all arise from the tissue, uh, from the breast tissue. But still, even you know, that particular tissue or the blood you know, forming leukemia, each of those tissues functions with slightly different parameters in each individual. Um, and 
once the tumor forms, of course, uh, tumors acquire a whole bunch of uh, errors in their, in their genetic codes and also in their epigenetic codes. So then you, and those vary greatly from patient to patient. So you wind up having is a complex situation where the inter, the natural inter-individual variability plus the great variability that occurs when tumors form collectively uh, lead to each patient's tumor behaving in a slightly different manner. So what we're striving to do is to decode in patients the genetic and epigenetic instruction so we can figure out how individual tumors are different from each other and then use that information to guide diagnostics and uh, therapeutic decisions. Because the, the number of data points that you capture per patient is in the millions or now even billions, uh, we, use, uh, we have been uh, developing mathematical and computational tools to actually interpret those results and create models that explain the behavior of different patients' tumors. So by doing that, we, um, um, of course, that requires some time to build models on a large, very large scale, but we are looking at thousands of cancer patients to try and decode this information and come up with the rules that tell us how to personalize medicine to those individuals. Yeah.